Have you ever wondered if it's possible to live in sync with your cycle? Do you struggle with a negative mindset around your period? Are you wondering if it's possible to be feminist and anti-birth control? We're going to explore these questions and so much more in the Managing Your Fertility podcast, because this is about helping you live a whole and full life. I'm your host and guide, Bridget Busacker, joining you in this journey of exploration related to women's health care, feminism, and fertility awareness. Are you ready? Let's get started. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. So excited to have you on today. So excited to be here, Bridget. So before we jump into our conversation around fertility and clean beauty, cleaning out our personal care products, I'd like to give an introduction to all our listeners. Elizabeth Marcolini is an entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, and executive director with Beauty Counter. Elizabeth holds a master's in theological studies from the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Dallas. She was also a John Jay Fellow, an Alliance Defending Freedom Arate Fellow, and has spent many weeks in Africa doing educational mission work with a specific focus on faith formation. Her greatest joy is being a wife to her husband, Matt. I'm just so excited to jump into this conversation (laughs) and all of the background and expertise you bring into this space is just fantastic. So let's get into it. Tell us about your story and really what's motivated you Mm. for changing out your makeup, your personal care products, working with beauty counter, all of it. <laughs> yeah, totally. This, this topic is so exciting for me. Um, I, first of all, thank you again, Bridget, for having me on. I'm so excited about this podcast for you and just that more women, hopefully if you're listening to this, just having like, what a blessing it is to have the resources that Bridget is providing because they're so needed in our world that, um, I, I don't think we understand the holistic nature of women's health and, uh, fertility. So I'm just very grateful for the information and resources that Bridget is putting out into the world. Um, so yes, so my journey to, to clean products and in my just whole fertility journey is a topic that I've become very passionate about and it's eventually what drove me to beauty counter. So my husband and I, uh, she said, my husband, Matt, he's my, my whole stinking world. I love him so much. Um, and we got married almost four years ago now in June can hardly believe that. Um, and when we got married, I think like a lot of, a lot of other Catholic couples, we just thought, you know, we're open to life and, you know, we'll just have all the kids, right. I'm the oldest of seven. And, um, I was so excited at, you know, the thought of having a big family and still am. Um, but lo and behold, that's not what the plan that God had, like, um, infertility, like was a quick reality that we came to terms with, um, within the first year of our marriage, just lots of tests and questions. Um, and so it was during that first year when I was really wrestling with my health. And I think I had taken for granted so many pieces of my hormones and cycling and just my fertility. Right. Um, I had really thought that this was something that kind of just came with the package, right. That this is as being a woman de facto, I'm going to be hyper fertile. Um, and I, I don't really need to think about it. Now I'd been doing, you know, tracking beforehand and things like that, but, um, but very illuminating went to the doctor's office one day for one of the, you know, many appointments. And he said, it's kind of an offhand remark at the end of our, our visit. He said, you know, and Elizabeth, be be attentive basically to what you're putting on your skin. And I was like, time out. What are you talking about? You know, I, I, what do you mean what I'm putting on my skin? I was like, I'm not, you know, sitting here bathing in like progesterone or or estrogen or something. And he kind of laughed and and he was like, no, you know, but our skin is, you know, our largest organ. We absorb a lot of it and in personal care products can have endocrine disruptors. So I get in the car and call my mom, who is a nurse and who had been trying to get me for months to try beauty counter. And I called her and I was like, all right, you may or may not have been right. I was like, but I'm going to go to Whole Foods. I'm going to try something, you know, like clean. Right. I, I, I literally knew nothing about this topic. I was like, okay, Whole Foods has got to have clean products. Right. I mean, they're probably made from like, you know, ethically sourced avocados harvest by, I don't know, like, right. So, <laughs> so I was like, this has got to be a safe place to get a good product. So I, I walk in there and I just remember feeling very overwhelmed. Right. I was like, I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what to trust. I, I don't, I, I just felt unsure. Right. Um, and so I remember I, I got like a body lotion and I was like, okay, that, that'll be the first thing I'll try and switch. Right. And I came home, tried it on. And I remember that night, like Matt came, 
comes into the room and he was like, what is that smell? And I was like, oh my gosh, what do you mean? And he was like, that smells like my grandmother. He's like, whatever that is. He's like, he's like, no, you can't use that. He's like, I don't know what smell that is, but it smells like a grandma. So I called my mom and I was like, all right, you totally win. Like, I, I want to try this beauty counter company. Like, even though it's probably going to make me smell like a tree, like I, I'm just, I'm, you know, I, I want to make healthier choices for our family. Um, a month later I tried it. My skin was better than before. I couldn't believe, I truly could believe it. Like I was a Sephora Rouge member. I was like, Sephora is so much better than anything out there. And, um, and my, the products performs better than all of my other products. So in a in, long story short, long winded way of just telling you kind of how I dip my toe in was that was my journey. Um, and ever since then, I've just been kind of immersing myself and learning a lot more. And it's been a great passion project and business for me. That's so fantastic. I know I'm adding in all the sound effects of this because I can relate to the, <laughs> <laughs> the experience of trying different products. That's what I did too. I went to Whole Foods. I started hearing more about this and I was like, okay, I, I had initially learned about Beauty Counter and thought like, well, I don't want to like commit to any one brand, you know, not that that's what Beauty Counter was promoting anyway, but in my mind, I was thinking, I just need to know options. So I'm going to go to Whole Foods, went to Whole Foods, thankfully ran into a friend, you know, and I was like, well, thank you, God, because I have no idea what I'm doing. And she had recommended a few things, but I was looking at hand lotions and face products. And so I just picked up a few thinking like, I guess if they really don't work, I'll return it or I'll just, you know, eat it with for the cost and deal with it later. And some products were like, were nice. Some of the makeup and some of the skincare was like, I don't see a difference. This is really expensive and it doesn't even smell that good. So why would I do this? And I think it just re-solidified for me the idea that, oh, so clean makeup is kind of part of that crunchy granola family and I'm going <laughs> to smell like a tree. Yeah. Like it's just, I'm going to smell like nature. going to look like an 80 year old tree. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So the fact that it, I mean, that there's a company doing all the research and development and really pushing towards not only making the products work well and testing them and having studies that they share when you're looking at certain products on the website, but then also beautiful packaging, beautiful marketing, like all of that spoke to me as someone who was using drugstore, Sephora, Nordstrom, Macy's dabbling of makeup and seeing, you know, what drew me most was like the beauty of the products and like, oh, then they could actually work. Um, right. so you, you had mentioned that you're a Sephora Rouge member. So going from that to beauty counter and then, you know, beyond looking at different clean products and trying things out, I mean, was that like a total jump for you or did you find that it, w- it wasn't so bad having, you know, like beauty counter as a solid foundation? Cause it sounds like the products really worked for you. Yeah, that was the, I think the surprise was, you know, I, I, I definitely did a little bit of hodgepodging, but Sephora, I, you know, I tried a lot of brands within Sephora and Nordstrom's, but I totally had a bunch of drugstore products like, uh, like most women, right. I, I shopped around, um, but Sephora within the, the company, like I tried a lot of different skincare brands, um, and products. And so I'm actually grateful for that now, because I think I have a really wide baseline to kind of compare beauty counter to. So, you know, I can compare it to the drug drugstore or target brand I can I can I can compare it to like you know like like what am I thinking of this like very expensive oil I once ordered um oil of something something but um yeah so I think in this process I I I think I appreciated the quality of beauty counter first the clean part was just a bonus as something that I felt like I should do that was initially how I felt about it and Um, and then I think I fell in love with how well the products work. So I think it actually happened almost backwards for me. Like I switched there. I was prompted to switch because I wanted it to be clean, but I stayed because of how well it worked. That's awesome. I mean, and, and speak so well, I think to what beauty counter is doing and how well they're doing. Um, I know recently they were, um, Carlisle group invested more fully into the company. So it's, it's expanded so much more to be able to offer so many more products and opportunities. So, I mean, clearly they're doing something right in, in their, you know, strategy and business development, that this is becoming something that is starting to, starting to show up in our everyday language and, and in common conversations that we're having and in everyday conversations that it's not so far removed when we're talking about clean personal care products and things like that. Um, can you, can we just like transition into, you know, how do we start reviewing the products that we use? What are we looking at? What's in a lot of products? I know I'm, I'm throwing a few questions at you, but I think, you know, for my struggle, it, it was, okay, I'm hearing about all these different terms like phthalates and parabens and 
carcinogens. And it was like, is this, is this actually real? Like, how do I know? How are things vetted? <laughs> and quickly learned, like, there's not much vetting. A lot of companies are, are not really held to a standard in the United States specifically. Um, and so maybe you can just speak to more of that before I ramble on about my <laughs> frustration yeah. and all of that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. And that's something, you know, typically when I say the sentence to women, something clicks and uh, cause I know it did for me, which is that the FDA hasn't regulated the personal care industry. That means whatever is being put on your skin, your body, right. Your hair, all that. There's no governing authority. That's basically saying like the FDA, right. You know, you can't do X, Y, Z. Um, they haven't touched that topic since 1938 and only 30 ingredients are banned right now in personal care. So to give you an idea, like literally from the Philippines to Europe, like in a lot of places in between, there's, you know, a thousand plus ingredients that are banned for a variety of really good reasons, right? So whether it's um, like you had mentioned before, you know, carcinogenic ingredients, right? Which would mean like you know, they can have poisonous or harmful effects or endocrine disrupting ingredients, which is what I was really concerned about, which are things that can affect your hormones. So something that I had no idea about was how a lot of these products, so like parabens, that's a really big offender. And what's fascinating to me is when I joined Beauty Counter, no one knew this. This is, this is three years ago. And I really think that clean beauty is where organic food was at the, in the early 2000s. It was something bizarre, like maybe some people knew about it. Some people were doing farm to table long before it was cool. But, um, but now you go into a gas station and there's organic potato chips. Like it's just normal. Right. Um, and so I think that that's where clean beauty is for this reason is that people just don't know, but an educated consumer is a wise consumer. And so I think that that's a great part of beauty counters mission is trying to help people understand the complexity of this, but also providing a brand that you can trust. Right. Um, but that's another part of uh, something I love about beauty counter is we're not like, we are the only company doing this. We don't say that there are other brands that will highlight and say, this is a great company for bath salts, right. Or this is a great company for toothpaste. Right. Um, and so we've done, you know, like we, I, you know, at our beauty counter conferences for leadership, I've seen all, I've been introduced to great new products in other industries with similar like-minded thoughts, David's toothpaste, coat nail polish. Um, I'm trying to think of the other name of the bath salts company I love, but there's the point being that this is an industry that's growing and growing. And that's exactly what you said, Bridget, why the Carlisle group is investing and took a majority stake in beauty counter, which is, I mean, a huge financial firm, which is a really, really big deal um, because they see the, the emerging market of this business. The FDA stat is the one that impacted me the most. And that's what I had learned when I was at this. Uh, it was like a craft pop-up shop in someone's home. They had different local businesses and and I remember seeing a few people from beauty counter and they were talking about that, just like stats and just sharing, you know, about beauty counter and other brands and just the need for being educated consumers. And I loved that approach with the advocacy and education because that was really unique to me. Um, and I wasn't seeing that, you know, really in the makeup industry at all, you know, for the most part you go, unless you're working with, um, someone behind the counter and you're asking about a particular product, you're, you're buying on your own, you're guessing, you're matching on your own, all of those things. And that stat that the FDA has not made updates and added more rigorous checkpoints for companies since 1938 blew my mind because I was yeah. seeing that the EU, Canada, like they were doing a lot more than us. And I was thinking, what are we not doing like how has this not been addressed and I think it just really um, got me thinking a lot more about the tie-in with our fertility as women and fertility awareness as a whole that these are areas that we're we're just simply not you know we're, we're starting to see it sh shared more and more but we're not putting emphasis on it and we're not educating women and the need that they have to advocate in these areas to see change and mm -hmm. I think sometimes that can be exhausting you know that we're in the space that you know we hope to see this for future generations that these um more rigorous guidelines will be in place that more women will be educated at younger ages around their fertility and I think that integration aspect is so critical instead of thinking about these things in separate 
pockets or that they live in separate places. We've done that so long with the reproductive system that it's separate Mm -hmm. from the rest of the body. And, you know, as we're trying to bring that back into wholeness, we're also recognizing, okay, at least for me and what I'm seeing in the space of fertility awareness, we talk a lot about sleep and nutrition and stress and the need for understanding how these impact our cycle. But personal care products is something that is very hit or miss in this arena. And I, I noticed some talk about it. Alisa Vitti of the author of the woman code and flow living. She talks a lot about products and, and how they impact health. Um, but it's really hit or miss in an education based foundation for women to understand this, who are seeking answers and trying to figure out how to learn their body or receiving treat, treatment for reproductive health concerns. But like your doctor offhandedly, you know, remarks, Hey, you should probably think about what you're putting on you know, it's like, how are we not hearing about this so much sooner and not as an offhanded comment, but something that is really thoughtfully brought to our attention so that we can make good choices as consumers. Um, you know, what do you recommend for someone in this space and hearing this thing? Oh my gosh, I have to do something, (laughs) but it can be so overwhelming. You know, like where did you start when you were first learning and your doctor says this and you're thinking, okay, you know, you went to Whole Foods, you started with beauty counter. Like what were those next steps as you started to explore and realize, oh my gosh, this is a whole world. (laughs) This is a life. Totally. I, I think I started to view it like a puzzle, right? And if any of you are listening to this and you've ever been through an infertility journey, or maybe you are right now, um, you know that that feels like, you know, the, the puzzle of your life, right? It's, it's, um, it's a lot, it's complex. There's a lot of pieces and odds are it's never just one thing. Um, that's what I've learned. And I think that in reference to safer personal care, what I learned was it's a huge deal but it's one part of the puzzle. And so my thought was, I was like, if I can make safer choices in this area, you know, be more cognizant about what I'm eating, make sure that my hormones are in line, right? It was like, all of a sudden you have to kind of think about it as different pieces. But this for me was a piece of the puzzle that I could fix, right? Um, You know, I can't, you know, be sonogramming myself or blood work or whatever it is, but I can make better choices within our own home so that my body is performing at its best um, and I'm giving it what it needs, right? So I'm setting itself up for, to to basically optimize, you know, whether or not it's infertility or you just want to feel better, right? Um, I think of some of the studies I've read through the years that, you know, the average woman puts on almost 200 different ingredients, like onto our skin before we walk out the door. And you can better believe that a larger portion of those are not going to be actually helpful to you. Um, Right. And so many of these things, I think we just don't know. Like I didn't know before beauty counter that one of the primary ingredients in most mascara is called coal tar, which is the exhaust from petroleum. Right. I didn't know that Vaseline is a derivative of gasoline. You know, I didn't know that you know, parabens basically can mimic estrogen in your body to offset your hormones, right? It acts as low grade estrogen. I didn't know so many of these things and I just learned over time. So if you're listening to that and it's like, that's overwhelming. I, I, you know, I, I feel my, my head's exploding. Right. Um, I think it's like with anything, you know, when you go into the grocery store, there are probably brands you trust that are going to deliver good food for you. Like I trust Ezekiel bread and cereal. You know, I, I think that they're a brand that has earned my trust. Right. So in a similar way that you're not in the grocery store freaking out about like, is this non-GMO organic, natural green? What does it mean? Right. And the difficult part is that with food, we actually have certifications for what certain things mean. Like, pasture raised versus not that actually means something right whereas there's a ton of greenwashing in the beauty industry so my advice is always to find a brand that you really trust because if you put natural or clean on your product there's no regulation of what that actually means right so Maybelline could be saying this this mascara is natural and no one's going to stop them you know I really like well all of this and especially your point about you know, being in control over some of the decisions that we make and not a bad kind of control, you know, but in a sense that there's, um, responsibility. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Much better word responsibility (laughs) and, and really being able to make these decisions for ourselves where we can have impact so that we're not having to wait or, you know, we're not getting in this space of worry, but then we're thinking someone else has to do it. You know, like, Oh, the FDA needs to make changes. It's like, well, what can I do in the meantime? Because 
you know, that's, that's not going to happen right now. And in general, the government takes a while to make changes. And that's, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there's opportunity for us then to step in and say, okay, what can I do? What can I learn? Where can I make some changes for myself? Because there are those opportunities. And fortunately there are, you know, companies and there are individuals and different organizations working to help build out the education available. So you're not finding that you're having to sit with a stack of research papers. Maybe that's your thing and you love doing it, but I think for many it's an overwhelming task. So to be able to look to different organizations that have done the work and are continuing to do the work, it helps, I think, bring some relief to know, okay, I'm not totally going this alone and trying to figure it out and, you know, being disappointed by what I'm finding or not finding. Um, Something else that you had mentioned is greenwashing. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what that means? Because I think that's a piece that um, individuals just don't realize it was something I learned just really truly in the past year. And I had no idea that there was really no regulation for companies using certain terminology and that there, there isn't a more rigorous process to getting a certain kind of certification or label on a bottle. Right. Exactly. And, and that I think for me was one of the more challenging things was, okay, am I just buying into good marketing? Um, Right. Or, you know, when I look at this product and it says natural or clean or safe, or, you know, what does that mean? Um, And the reality is, frankly, it doesn't mean anything Um, unless the company itself is saying, what is, what does it actually mean that we're saying this is safer and why? And that's something I loved about Beauty Counter was because they were very honest with, they were like, look, we have something called a never list. That's why our products are safer. And it has over 1800 different ingredients that we will not use because of X, Y, and Z. Um, And this is, you know, we're explaining why on the website, like they, they highlight some of the worst offenders, you know, like PEGs or sulfates or parabens, which you probably heard me talk about. And there's, there's a lot more, unfortunately, like products can even contain things like formaldehyde. Right. Um, So I really appreciated the fact that beauty counter was, was educational in that way. They weren't just like throwing a label up there and not backing it up with tons of research. Um, We also have just as a company, I, again, something I really admire, we have a sustainability officer. She literally that her job is to track down and make sure our ingredients are not just safe, but they're ethically sourced. So we have the mica is a notorious product where it's, it's very hard to ethically source it because I guess the way the mines are often children are used in, in mining the mica. And so we have the first that we know of the first, you know, makeup company, which make mica is like the shiny product product and your highlighters, your lipsticks, like it's that beautiful shimmer. Um, we're the, we're the first makeup company to have sourced that supply chain to the very end. Like we have like talked to, like gone to the mines, like, you know, verified that. So uh, in that sense too, it's not just greenwashing, but I, I love the integrity of beauty counter. It's not just about our health. It's making sure that our contribution is, is not one that's, you know, misusing the humans that are involved with our process. So, um, those are a couple of reasons why I love beauty counter particularly, but I also think that whatever the company is, whether whether it's your laundry detergent or your cereal or whatever it is, right? It's just trying to make those more thoughtful choices to, you know, do the little bit of homework that says, okay, is this company a company I want to buy from? Is, is it a company that I trust, right? There's a lot of that, I think. Um, and th- now, does this mean that every single time you go to the grocery store, you're revetting it? No, because the reality is for most of us, we're buying the same things over and over again. Um, so I think in terms of personal care, like I've used beauty counter now for three years and I don't have to make that choice for myself anymore. Right. Like there are a couple other clean brands I've used and love, but there's like a simplicity to it in a lot of ways. So I'm not walking into the store and I'm like, I have no idea which product I should pick. I have no idea what's going to work because I know now I can totally relate to that feeling of overwhelm of looking at all these products and wondering, okay, this says natural, this says clean. Is it really, is it not? How would I know? And thinking like, okay, maybe I should try this one. You know, this foundation might be better than this other one. And this mascara could be better than the other one, but without any sense of a rubric to go off of or a list or, you know, a never list to see, okay, what is safe to use? What's not safe to use? Um, I think initially I thought, oh, this is going to limit my options so much, but it actually has been great because it's really challenged me to, you know, test out 
for sure different clean brands and products, but also really find the products that I like and stick to them and, and build out a routine, like build out a skincare routine, have the makeup products that I really enjoy and not living in this indecision or this FOMO really in fear of, oh, but maybe there's a better mascara. Maybe there's a better option. Maybe I should pay more. I, I know that I had no real sense of why I would pay more for a product if I could find a comparable one that was, was cheaper and I could get it at target. You know, there were, there was really no other checklist I was looking at to think about, okay, well, is this ethically sourced? Is this made with quality ingredients? What about the packaging? And I think, um, those were questions that I, I just never even thought about to help me in making a decision. Like, why would I pay more or less? You know, I think about all the, the magazines that I would read, especially around beauty. And it was like, okay, here's your, you know, Lancome mascara, your NARS concealer, and then here's your a comparable product at a lower price point if you want to do, you know, the two hundred dollar foundation or you want the twenty dollar foundation. Right. And I remember looking at it thinking, well, I, I want the twenty dollar. Like that just makes more sense for my budget. Like I don't really have a reason to buy the two hundred if if the twenty dollar really can offer me almost as good of coverage, if not better. Um, and I think this really segues in. I think with you know, I think that that conversation and those messages that I get from individuals like, well, what about costs? Like, how do I budget for this? Like, this seems like a lot of money. And Mm -hmm. it's like, well, in an Amazon prime fast fashion world, especially targeted towards women that we're always having to buy the next thing and do the next thing, you know, we're not really taking the time to ask those questions. You know, where are my products coming from? Who's making it? Who's getting paid for this? What's the packaging like? Is the product quality or not? What makes it quality? You know, what are the different factors that come into play that yes, this product might be, you know, in your eyes more expensive, but it also may be an upfront cost where that skincare product lasts for almost a year. (laughs) You know, I know I've had that with beauty counter where there's, yes, there's that upfront cost, but I, you know, it lasts me so long because it's so well-made. It's such high quality. I don't need to use a lot. And I'm not having this constant game of going back and forth to the store, keeping, you know, all these products in my cart or wanting to try more. It's that, that simplicity and, and really, it can help and be actually more cost-effective that way. Um, but maybe, you know, you can share a little bit more of that. Like how, how do you approach, you know, budgeting or would recommend to someone who's thinking, okay, well, I can't swap everything out at once. Like, how do I do this? Or, you know, why is beauty counter, you know, so, this seems more expensive than what I would find at Target. Why is that? Right. Yeah. No, it's a great question. And I think that, I mean, first of all, they're, they're, the price point is the way it is. It, you know, we're not trying to compete with, you know, CVS. We're trying to, we're basically at the same caliber and quality level as something you would buy at, at Nordstrom's or Sephora, right? It's that's, that's what you have to consider when you're looking at these. It's not going to be like, you know, the $5 eyeshadow when God knows what's in it or how well it works. Um, <laughs> you know, so you first, I think it's just the mindset of that is like that, that is a different you know, approach, but they're also, you know, if you're like, gosh, I can spend, you know, $30 on my skincare. We do have one line that I I think is great for people in that position. It's called counter start. And the products are like a big tube, like a kind of a, you know, a big tube of, um, moisturizer and a big tube of cleanser. And so it's very simple, very basic, but it's a great place to start. If you're like, I just want to switch to clean. I'm, I'm pretty low maintenance and I just want something that's good for sensitive skin or, you know, just a, a gentle clean product. Um, so I, I always point people to that if that's a big concern. And even if you're like, gosh, I want to explore like different skincare options, but I'm a little curious. I think Bridget, what you said, the fact that they last a long time, that's so true. Like, I mean, I, you know, I have an eye cream right now. I've had for like eight months, you know, and I'm just finishing it. So there, there really is like a longevity to the products I've, I found. Um, and I think you, you totally hit the nail on the head with this. Like I know before I probably spent more money on products before because of exactly what you described, which is, oh, maybe this product will be better, or maybe this product will, you know, be a better foundation or a better mascara or whatever it is. Right. And all of a sudden you have a drawer full of makeup, you know, that you don't love. Um, and I think that for me, beauty counters really simplified a lot of that because I love everything I use, you know, and I don't feel the need to rush out there and, you know, buy eight new shadow palettes, right? Because I'm not happy with the ones I have. Um, And I think as women, like, let's be honest, like we're so prone to that, um, that I think having, you know, a brand or two that you really trust um, and you get like 
really good high quality basics means that your life is honestly more minimalistic in a beautiful way. Um, even though like we have, you know, minimalist, not in the sense that you're going to look again, like an 80 year old tree, but you know, that's <laughs> another thing I love and appreciate about beauty counter is like the look is like very natural, very bright, very dewy, but it can also be like very glamorous. Like it's, um, I, I just really appreciate that about beauty counter. It's not one way or the other. You're not looking fake and you're not looking like, does this person have any makeup on? So, yeah. <laughs> I think your, your point about, and, and to clarify you even more with where beauty counter positions itself, as far as quality and pricing and everything goes, um, it, it is, it's higher end and it's higher end intentionally. They're making, you know, quality products that last a while that have research and development lab behind it to make sure that it's safe. And not only that, they're focusing on environmentally friendly packaging. And we're, you know, I, I keeps going between you and we, so I'm also a beauty counter consultant and I joined because I saw this need to connect personal care products to the fertility awareness movement, because I was seeing such an inconsistent conversation around it or a lack of conversation. And that's not a, a, by any means to bash colleagues. It's just that there are so many topics related to fertility awareness. And this was one that just wasn't getting as much attention as it really needs to. And, um, you know, I think when it comes to budgeting on a practical note, it's, it's also starting with one thing at a time. You know, I think to automatically assume, oh, this product seems really expensive. I can't pay for that. I'm going back to my Target or my drugstore. Well, you know, ask those questions around how is this product made? Is it what's in this product? Does it, is it good for my health? You know, maybe you're not as motivated by the environmental factors in the packaging and you're thinking, okay, that's nice, but I really want this to work for me. Totally right. get that. And I think um, it's just good to ask those, those questions and to have a checklist of what you look at or a rubric, whatever you want to call it to really give you some guiding points to discern, you know, is this worth it or not? And I think, you know, with the Amazon Prime fast fashion industry and just how quickly we are to buy and throw out and we start applying that mentality to our health instead of really thinking, you know, in, instead of having, you know, 10 different eyeshadow palettes or 50 different products used on your skin, you know, what's really going on in your skin? How many different things are you putting on? What chemicals are in them? Like this is impacting your health long-term. Does it mean after, you know, a couple of swipes of a, you know, dirty mascara, you're, you're getting cancer? Well, no, it's over time, but you know, to see that impact, um, to me that that's worth the cost that's worth paying for a quality product. In addition to actually having it work really well, and to see my skin healthier than it has been, that's amazing too. But I think, you know, we have to incorporate those questions around our health and, and being able to think about, okay, it's not necessarily throwing absolutely everything out in your cupboard this, you know, instant you turn off this episode, but it's saying, okay, what's one thing I could switch out. Um, and I remember you bringing this up on our Instagram live that I loved it, when you had said, you know, look at and figure out what is that product you're using the most. And if it's not ranking well, and if it's it looking like it has a lot of different chemicals in it, consider sw switching that, that one item out and just taking one step closer to cleaner living, one step closer for your health and being, you know, in a much better space for your endocrine system, for your hormonal responses, for your reproductive health, your sleep. You know, there's so many different ways in which, like you talked about, these different chemicals negatively impact our bodies. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about the environmental working group app, because that was something you had mentioned in our previous Instagram live. And it's mentioned yeah. a lot by different individuals online, email lists and, and figuring out how do I know rankings for my, my products, if they're clean or not. Right. Yeah, no, I, that Bridget, that's exactly the way I switched over products, like is, is just bit by bit. And I think that if you're listening to this and again, it's like, I have like everything in my house is needs to be switched over. I was totally in the same position and I did it over the course of like a year. You know, when I ran out of my laundry detergent, I bought a clean alternative. When I ran out of, you know, XYZ, I switched, right? And it was just one thing at a time. Now, there were some products that, like Bridget said, I like looked up, figured out they were like really bad, and I just chucked them. I was like, it's not worth it. Like, it, you know, this $5, you know, mascara is not worth it or whatever it is. Um, 
I also think starting with body lotion is smart just because it does cover the surface area of your body and just making sure that what you're putting on in terms of like soap, body wash, you know, lotion, like things that cover large swaths of your uh, skin that focusing on that first as well. But yeah, the EWG app was super helpful in that process of switching over products. Um, It's yeah, the environmental working group. It's like a little green app in the app store. Uh, you can download it. It's free. It's so useful. I believe it has a barcode scanner still. Um, I used it a lot initially, um, especially to look up cosmetics. And, you know, what I found there was really fascinating. And what I appreciate about the app is that they tell you why they rated it the way they did. So if this is, you know, a uh, high cost for concern, it's like a red, you know, red product. And you're like, ah, what's in here? They'll tell you why it is that way. And um, so I think that in the process of just, you know, scanning stuff in, in the store, you can quickly learn why certain ingredients are harmful, but the app does the work for you. So you're not like squinting to read the label of your foundation bottle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which is so great. And that's what I have used as well. And in, in taking that approach and just saying, okay, where are my products ranking? And then, you know, in some ways I would just like pile them out and say, okay, these ones are, are doing pretty well. So I'm going to continue using these when they're done. I'm not going to replace them. And then there were those others that, you know, weren't that expensive when I bought them anyway, like what you were saying, like the $5 mascara or the $10 lotion or whatever it was. And I was like, okay, this is like coming up red all over the place. Right. I am just going to get rid of it. This isn't worth it to me to finish using it. And, you know, to pleasantly finding, oh, I do have some products that are clean. That was awesome to see that. Um, and a great point too, about just, you know, looking at like lotion and body wash and things where it's covering your body. Um, because I think those definitely, I don't know, for me, I didn't think about that right. Away. I was just like stuck on, Oh, it's gotta be makeup. And like what I put on my face. And then I started thinking, Oh yeah. Like what about what I wash my clothes in or when I'm washing my hands with soap at the kitchen sink or, Oh yeah. I put on lotion every night before bed. What the heck am I using? You know, just it's again, it's that awareness. And I think, you know, just starting to piece together and have that mindfulness around, okay, what am I using? How often am I using it? And is this good for me or not? And, and starting to take those opportunities as, you know, knowledge for, for small change so that it doesn't have to be something all at once, but just one thing at a time, because I think that's, um, that's where we see the most changes, like those micro changes that lead to, to macro changes, which are huge and can make the most impact in our health as well. Um, you know, I think something that I'm, I'm also thinking about with this, that, that tie to health and how it almost sounds like a gimmick. You know what I mean? Like there's <laughs> just this, there's just this reality of like, really my personal care products could really impact my health. Um, and I think, you know, maybe you can speak to this a little bit more just in the process of your learning and, you know, having that comment from your doctor really starting you off and your mom saying like, Hey, you need to try this. You know, <laughs> what, what has been your, um, you know, obviously, you know, we talked about this throughout, throughout the interview here, but you know, what were those moments for you in, in reading or research that you were like, oh my gosh, this is so real. Like, this is actually real. This isn't just some like made up thing to market clean beauty or to market a movement. Right. There was, uh, so this was a study that I, I thought was really interesting because there aren't as many peer reviewed studies as there really should be on the topic, but there are some that are fascinating. These two in particular stand out. One was, um, there's a a CNN article I pulled and found, but it talked about the average toxic chemical count in the umbilical cord blood of babies. And it was like almost 200 different chemicals that are like downright toxic that come from personal care that were found in that blood. And I was like, well, that's, you know, that's alarming. And that's, uh, that seems very definitive, right? So that was number one. And then another study that I read that was just very, shocking was, I believe it was called the Hermosa study. Um, I think it was done at Berkeley, but it was, it was peer reviewed and like redone at, um, published in Oxford. Um, so you can look it up in both places, but they basically took two groups of teenage girls and gave one of the groups like, you know, normal personal care products with endocrine disruptors, right? Cause most products have them. Parabens are the most common preservative and personal care products. Um, So our bodies deal with a lot of them if you're using over-the-counter products every day. And then the other group of these girls did not have those products. And the fascinating thing to me was the girls with the endocrine disrupting products, they hit puberty earlier 
and they were like very affected in other ways. So that was fascinating to me because that was a very concrete, you know, distinction, right? At a pretty vulnerable age, marking a like, you know, notable, you know, irrefutable life event, right? Um, you know, having your period. And I just, I, my eyes really felt open, you know, upon reading that. I, something else, I, I, there's so much, there's so many of these stories I could tell. Another one on actually the guy side that's fascinating. Um, I believe there's a book on this. It's called, I think it's called Countdown. I'm pretty sure. Um, there's a, a lot of different books on this topic coming out because of the huge decline we've seen in, um, basically the efficacy of sperm in guys and they attribute a lot of that to personal care because so many of these products are estrogenic well wow this is just disgusting and horrifying really (laughs) you know to hear this I'm just like oh my gosh and I know we're mentioning a few different resources I'll be sure to include that in the show notes but I mean these are these are really important factors for us to be thinking about especially you know as women the fact that you know, young girls are seeing changes in their body and onset of puberty that much sooner. And, you know, I, I totally agree with you that peer reviewed research, we just need so much more of it, especially around, you know, again, reproductive health and other aspects of our health, other hormonal disruptors, you know, what's really going on in the body. Um, and, and I think too, just to emphasize beauty counter is not the only one talking about this. They just have done a really good job in building out a business model and continuing to develop and expand their research and development lab for, lab for products to, to expand this conversation and to make sure that women have this information. And there are still so many that have never heard of this, you know, but there are other companies working on this as well. And just the amount of information that's coming forward that you're seeing, you know, Goop is a big one that individuals talk about with Gwyneth Paltrow. Mm-hmm. And she talks a lot about clean beauty and highlighting different um you know, different chemicals, not necessarily, again, saying you have to buy Goop or you have to buy X brand. It's no, but you need to be aware what brands are using these products and what brands are not using, I shouldn't say product, these chemicals so that you can make an informed decision as a consumer. And I think that really comes down to the biggest thing, you know, being informed, being, right. being aware of what's going on and what's going in your body and on your body. And if, you know, you're hearing this and thinking like, okay, I want, I want to take a a stab at trying something that's awesome. And you should, you know, there are different opportunities to review your products, to try different brands. Um, you know, I think for both of us, we, we've landed on beauty counter because they do an excellent job. They're super transparent. They're doing really well. They're growing at an exponential rate. And there are so many, um, you know, individuals who are purchasing or, you know, working for beauty counter or advocating for clean change or, you know, seeing the need for more acts in laws around, oh my gosh, so many different things with personal care products, you know? So I think there are just so many different avenues to get involved and to make change, you know, on a personal level, but then also I think from an advocacy standpoint. So final question for you, for someone who's thinking, okay, I'm already switching out clean products, but I want to do more. I want to Mm. advocate, or I want to speak to this, or I want to find different ways to get involved. What have you seen, or would you recommend to someone um, just to give some ideas for what they could do next? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm all, my door is always open. Feel free to send me a message. I think that, I mean, I know for me, this business was a a blessing and a huge surprise because I think that in sharing it with other people, that's a great way to advocate. And, um, you know, I've, I've met women who are like, my mom has ovarian cancer. I wish you would have known about this. Right. And all of a sudden they're passionate and they're talking about it with their friends. And so I think that word of mouth is a really powerful educator. And so I think just taking the wisdom that you've, you know, hopefully heard on this podcast and, um, and sharing it with others is just, you know, a a piece of the puzzle and, um, a a healthier choice for, for women to be making. So, um, that's, I think the best place to start. And then obviously if you want to go like, you know, above and beyond that beauty counter has a lot of resources for, um, you know, texting certain numbers, right. To, you know, encourage certain States to pass legislation on safer beauty. Um, so that's, that's definitely an avenue to look into as well. Awesome. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on the show and just sharing your wisdom and expertise in this space. It's really just such a joy to chat with you. I could keep going and just saying, let's (laughs) dig in more, but I hope this is helpful for listeners and just really expanding on this conversation. And, And Elizabeth, you know, for you sharing more of your why and 
why you are, you know, not only advocating for clean beauty, you're a part of Beauty Counter, you're advocating for cleaning out personal care products and sharing your story over on your platforms and blog, which has just been beautiful to see. So I'm just really grateful for you and for your voice and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Bridget. I appreciate that. And and so glad to be together on this journey, helping, helping women to make better choices. So, um, so, so grateful for the time today. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends and help expand the conversation around women's health. If you'd like to learn more about fertility awareness, visit www.managingyourfertility.com for more information, resources, guides, and so much more.